Okay, well, thank you so much for coming. This is the third session of, um, at the Art Hub here at, for Arts and Culture. The uh, title of uh, this session is Art Therapy, Art Heals. And as much as I try to memorize the credentials of the guests, I have failed because of the bus experience that they have. So I'll turn the mic over to uh, Dalal Sindhi. Hi everyone, I thank you very much for uh, attending this breakout session. Uh, my name is Dilal al um, I'm an art therapist and um, qualified from the University of Hertfordshire in England. I've worked in uh, Riyadh in the rehabilitation hospital and from then on went back to Bahrain where I started the first art therapy practice in the Kingdom of Bahrain in 2012. And Sarah Powell. Hi, <laughs> good afternoon. Um, my name is Sarah Powell. I am from the UK. I grew up in the UAE since the age of 12. I trained as an art psychotherapist in Singapore. I was there for six years. Um, I got married, I came back, and I founded um, Attic Psychological and Counseling Center in Dubai, and um, we're the first, I believe, um, art psychotherapy center in the UAE. Um, I work with children um, all the way to adults, and and uh, we also have uh, the honor to consult with government agencies also. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Dalal. Um, we'll start off with the difficult questions. Um, the first question is healing power of art therapy, clinical and non-clinical. Dalal, can, can we start with you? Yes, thank you. Um, I think in the beginning, just to give a brief uh, like explanation about the difference between clinical and non-clinical, they are very similar. The difference is basically clinical, any clinical practice will be based in a hospital, so the patients need immediate uh, treatment. A non-clinical approach would be um, like uh, myself and uh, Sarah, when we work in a center that we actually um, have clients, we work on a long-term basis according to actually the, t you know, the time that's needed for the patient to actually develop and have some results. Um, to just give you an idea, um, I've worked in a clinical setting in a rehabilitation hospital in Riyadh where we were referred patients from stroke ward uh, and traumatic Brain, uh, brain injury and spinal cord injury. Keep in mind the setting that I was in was in Riyadh. We're in a hospital. The colors of the hospitals are gray. So when these clients um, had these sessions from the morning until the afternoon to do with physical therapy, occupational therapy, art therapy was the only kind of psychological support for these clients. So it was very interesting approach in that, um, in that hospital because the art therapists worked hand in hand with the occupational therapists. So uh, keep in mind the patients were either paraplegic or um, quadriplegic, which means they were paralyzed. Some of them had little motor skills and some of them not. So what we did was in collaboration with the occupational therapist and the art therapist, we would take on the um, psychiatric, uh, psycho, psycho logical side and they would um, try to find basically a basis where they can um, where they can develop the patient's fine motor skills um, or upper limbs and we would let, let's say um, collaborate with finding the tools through art medium to actually make that happen okay so Dana, let me cut you off there and just I'll, I'll ask you a question um, you mentioned something about spinal cord injury and back injury and stuff and I mean, I can, then, I can understand if somebody has depression and, and so forth, how art can affect that. Um, how does it affect somebody with spinal cord injury, for example? How, how does your special treatment uh, affect uh, something structural? Um, especially in the hospital, with my experience, most of the spinal cord injury patients were young adults. Uh, some of them married, um, and of course, when these accidents happen or engaged, um, their, uh, let's say, now we have a few cases where the fiancé or their wife left them because of, um, because of the actual limitations that that trauma has on the individual. Um, they are inpatient, so they're, they've got the energy, they've got all of that, but there is the depression sets on them to the point that it is very difficult for them to even undergo the physical therapy program and the occupational therapy program. So, okay. yeah, so let, um, for example, with the art, how I can, um, 
the approach that we have towards that is that they'll see something colorful is out of curiosity. Bring them in. Let's see what you like. They'd, they'd want to talk because let's say they're inpatients. All day they're in bed. They want to move. They're young. They're still, they have their mental capability. They have their emotional capability. And then the emotional capability. And being the only kind of clinic in that ward that has this colorful scheme, when you see people coming in, they get encouraged. Okay. So within that, the making of art gives them an opportunity to actually prove to themselves that they actually can do something. Great. So I'll stop you right there. So Sarah, I mean, um, taking off from, from where Dalal uh, ended and also uh, to explain um, the, the slide that you have put sure. up. Um, so basically, I think um, we look at things from a continuum. I don't know how many um, of you are familiar with the profession of art therapy. Uh, maybe, you, maybe most of you are artists or engaged in art also. Um, and art has a healing capacity in general. So one end of the spectrum, we look at artists and the impact of art that it has on our communities. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum is where Dalal and I sit um, as art psychotherapists. Um, and again, art psychotherapy um, uh, is a profession specifically um, with a minimum of a master degree in art psychotherapy. We are mental health practitioners, like you would go and see a psychologist perhaps or a counsellor. We have a triangular relationship here, so instead of it being just a two-way relationship where we're discussing about some of our issues or tapping into some of our strengths, we would use the arts as a way to uh, establish dialogue and understand the inner world. And sometimes it's really hard to be able to kind of express ourselves through language. So, Sarah, just mm -hmm. explain this to me, and I'm going to ask a really sure. dumb question, maybe. Yeah. Um, so is it that some, you tell somebody to draw a picture, and then you mm -hmm. look at it and you say, oh, well, you need a vacation or something yeah. like that? Or yeah. No, I think that's actually an excellent question. Um, so basically what happens is we have a whole um, array of art media always continuously in, um, in our session, from pencils, which is more restrictive media, all the way to fluid media, which is um, paint and clay and so forth. And we believe the different media that each person engages in evokes different emotional responses. And from then, it's not just the aesthetic of the artwork, but it's also the process. How are they engaging with the art media? How are they engaging with myself as an art therapist? So, for example, I was, um, as Dilal mentioned, in a hospital setting, I was working uh, with eating disordered patients in um, a specialized um, uh, hospital in Singapore. And we would use the art media, for example, to understand the relationship with food. So, for example, we'd run a group, and there may be some, um, some of the participants who had bulimia and some participants who had anorexia. And those with anorexia, it's a generalization, but typically the observation was that they would gravitate towards pencils, restrictive media. Those that were purging, um, who may be bulimic, they may um, over-identify with some of the art materials more from the fluid side of things, and they would then reenact their behaviors with food within the artwork. And then we would sit down and we would say, what's happening, you know? And um, how does this relate to your eating disorder? What do we need um, also on an emotional level to be able to kind of support this? What is happening? What is reenacting? How can we look at this from a different lens in order to kind of break that cycle, in order to help you on an emotional level and not use the food as a distraction? from what may be underpinning that, which may be something difficult that they're needing to express. So, yeah. Sarah, I've, I've, I tried to educate myself on this before sure. the talk. Yeah. We spoke a little bit yeah. about this. Um, some things that I found when I was... When, oh, sorry. Um, some things that I found when I was um, uh, reading or, or studying the subject mm -hmm. um, were two, two maybe simple stories. Mm -hmm. um, one of them was... Um, they, 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 they made the test on children mm -hmm. and they told them to draw their families and uh, there was some, some children who drew the family for example and they drew certain members of the family bigger than what they really are in, compar yeah. in comparison to other members. Some people they drew the mothers bigger than the father mm -hmm. or the, 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 the younger sister bigger than the father so yeah. forth and it's it, it, and yeah. it meant something. Sure. Second thing was um, was using uh, I mean uh, visual something I don't know the, the medical term where they 
studied on children with cancer and they had them um, imagine that the disease was uh, uh, of a certain color and their uh, red blood cells were like tigers fighting uh, fighting the, the, the disease and they showed uh, significant um, improvements. Yeah. Any, any facts to yeah. this? Um, so I think the first question, just to answer extremely briefly, um, maybe to comment on that, is that we're not fortune tellers also okay so the artist the participant that's in engaging in art therapy it's their reality i might see that the sky is blue and they may see that the sky is pink and that's okay because that's how we need to reach them halfway we need to enter into their into their inner world um, also we need to take culture into consideration art psychotherapy is a western-born profession how does that fit here regionally also from a cultural perspective? Um, I'm from the UK, and if you see some, a child drawing rain, sometimes that kid paints, oh, it's one of those days. It's a, it's a dismal day, it's a gloomy day. But here, rain is a blessing. So again, we have to also take into consideration the cultural elements of symbolism too. Um, and we typically get the, the client that we're working with to verify what does your art mean to you specifically. Um, and I think that's very important. I mean, we are trained to see certain uh, symbols and lines and quality positioning of artwork, um, which may warrant further investigation or so on. Um, but most of the time, we get the client to, to verify their own process. Okay. And the second question that you, answer, uh, that you brought up also um, in reference to children with cancer, um, it's tapping into their resilience. Sometimes it's very difficult to talk about uh, painful experiences. And for children, it's a very natural way to engage in fantasy and metaphor. And as adults, we're afraid of that sometimes. So my child is saying that there is a monster under the bed. So how do we engage with that monster? You know, how do we engage with that through art therapy? Instead of killing the monster off, how do we try and engage with that monster, make it less scary? So we're helping to develop resiliency. Um, and there's a lot of evidence based to answer your question, which shows that art therapy is specifically beneficial in doing so in pediatric oncology patients, yeah. And Dalal, you had, you had an experiment with, with rain and drawing the rain and stuff. Do you want to elaborate on that? Um, there was like there is certain kind of assessment that were actually introduced in 1948 by a psychologist, a clinical psychologist called uh, John Buck, who um, I think might uh, Sarah might be first one. Um, so it was like a set of assessment that was before the birth of um, of actual uh, of the of art therapy. They saw that there is certain kind of um, assessment procedures or symbols that are very basic that can actually give you a bit of insight into um, the creative process of the individual. What I personally do in a clinical set, in a non-clinical setting in the art therapy center, how do I can initiate the client into the artwork is that. In the beginning, I ask them to draw either a house, three person. The house, I would also express that the house would be and symbolize, symbolize a safety. How safe do you feel? The person's self image. Um, and the tree is the environmental um, giving and taking, whether it is a professional or in a professional sense or a societal sense. So um, that's a client that I had um, for about two years, um, and she suffered from depression. She was 25 years old. Um, I asked her to draw a person in the rain. It's very interesting because one of the points that um, when you see the rain, you can see the figure has no features at all. There's no uh, protection from the rain. So after that, we converse. There's an activity, as Sarah mentioned, the triangular relationship, which means that there's an activity to bind both of us, um, to bind both of us into that. So I can maybe encourage her by asking certain questions to allow her to talk. A different activity which I find very helpful to ease the clients into the art therapy is to give them collage work. The collage work would be anything that pops up in your mind, cut it and paste it. Let's just see what kind of grabs. And I also wanted to mention that our cogn cognitive faculty is visual. When I see something, I get affected. When I see something happening, I get affected. So vision and seeing instigates memory. Memory instigates emotion, 
that emotion instigates a reactive um, experience towards, towards myself. Let's say if you have a bad dream, you'd wake up and it's in visuals. You can't even describe it in words. And that's how I think the magnitude of the visual faculty that we have is very important. And as adults, we actually stop using this um, instinctual and therapeutic tool that we have um, in, as an art, uh, which kids actually don't get taught. You don't ask a child to, um, you don't show him how you can pick up a crayon and scribble. He does it instinctually. But you have to teach him how to write. You have to teach him how, how to speak. So that in itself is a free language that's, that can be understood globally. Okay, so uh, last question before we turn it to, uh, to the audience. Uh, Sarah, best practices in therapeutic art globally, mm. your opinion? Yeah. So, um, again, I think the, the social care sector is really developing here. And it's typically in, in, all, um, in all countries the last sector to, to, to fully be developed. Um, and art psychotherapy, totally biased, believe that it, it should be an option for the community. So it may not be for everybody, and that's okay, but I think it should be an option. Um, and then if we also kind of look at what's happening in, in US and UK, for example, um, with the associations and so forth, I think best practice is one practice what we preach also to maybe model um, uh, from, from the West, but then develop culturally sensitive interventions which fit our community here, which means that Dalal and I should be doing more research um, uh, to provide an evidence base here. Um, and I think also uh, as part of our own practice, and I'd like to say that I think best practice globally is for all therapists to go for their own therapy, which was also mandated in, in order for us to be licensed. And I think that should continue. And I think that would help to kind of destigmatize also um, the relationship between client and therapist. Um, yeah, uh, that's from my perspective. I mean, just, just one, one more question. Mm -hmm. I mean, when my daughter was really young, she had a Barbie doll. Mm -hmm. and she took all her clothes off and yeah. pulled her head off. Yeah. Should I send her your way? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? I, I, I think, again, we can look at things from a continuum. There are, there are, there are more kind of significant uh, challenges that people may face which may impact their, their functioning. And I think that would definitely um, equate to, from my perspective, gaining some support, whether that's from art therapy or, or any other mental health practitioner. On the other side, I think it's, um, you know, as a child, if I had the skill set and opportunity from a young age to be able to kind of express and so forth, we may be able to kind of help ourselves in, in adulthood, to prevent a lot of <laughs> problems. So I think what if we just look at things from a preventative place? Um, and that shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't be afraid of that. I think as community, sometimes we get scared. I'm going to send my child to go and see a mental health practitioner. Why are we afraid? Like, we all have challenges, myself mm. included. Um, and what if we look at developing strengths also as a preventative, from a preventative place? We could really kind of safeguard and help um, move our societies and communities along in, in, in a, in a non-threatening way. Yeah. Also, may I add, um, actually, the clients that I see in Bahrain, when the parents call, they're like, I saw it's art therapy. That's, that eases them into coming in for the child not to be in a therapy or a doctor. I'm not taking it to a doctor. They come in and they're like, oh, it's art. It's like, it eases that. And that's not only for children, Tara, also for adults. And also, I just wanted to add, um, just like literally last week, um, I saw an article from the journal, uh, American Journal of Medicine that art therapy is now proven as a, a therapeutic, important therapeutic intervention in hospital. That's Wonderful. one. And another one, sorry, I just wanted to add that um, they made a statistic as well in, um, in Scotland, in uh, the hospital in Glasgow, uh, where they did a survey bringing in artwork, for, um, exhibiting artwork in the, um, in the hospital. And then after a few months, they did a survey 43% of the people documented that the mental health, um, the mental health in their patients has actually increased in a way that they could really um, uh, note in their medical kind of uh, referral, which is brilliant, I think. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. So now, does anybody have any questions? Yes. 
Thank you so much. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, my name is Zaina Yagan. Um, I'm Syrian, so I'm coming from a war zone. So my question is: uh, Is the art therapy is applicable for families who came from war zones? Yes. <laughs> um, so actually, just to answer that. Um, uh, it is. Um, art therapy was born from the Second World War in Europe, actually. Um, parts of the brain that deal with language, the language centers of the brain, can shut down, which means that it's very difficult for someone that has probably faced a lot of trauma to be able to kind of communicate um, that experience. Um, so it definitely can be beneficial. The problem, I think, is the sustainability of support. So for art therapists to kind of go over there um, and to rehabilitate severe trauma can be anything from a year to a year and a half of consistent therapeutic work. And therapy typically in situations like that is a luxury, to be very honest. Um, again, it's a rebuilding infrastructure and so forth. So I think in that line, the most beneficial thing to do would be to tap into the resources that are available, maybe do train the trainer models until um, that could be offered more sustainably. I had, uh, yeah. thank you, Sarah. I had the absolute pleasure and honor to actually work with the refugee, Syrian refugee children in September in uh, Sabra and Shatila camp in Beirut and Shatura um, camp in Balabak. Um, the one I did in uh, Sabra and Shatila was for adults, and the one in Balabek was actually very, very insightful. I was um, absolutely amazed at the strength of these children mm. and actually portraying exactly um, their kind of experiences very truthfully. Um, and when I asked them what happened, they would actually say in detail, the pictures, when I, unfortunately, I did not uh, bring them in, in but uh, you would find them on my Instagram, is that where they actually were very, very um, brave into honestly saying exactly what happened. Yes, my mother died in front of me. They uh, shot my school. I saw my friends pass away. And we're talking about kids uh, that are 10 to 12 years old. And as heartbreaking as it is, I was absolutely honored and I cannot, it's unfathomable their strength and bravery into actually saying that and drawing on that. I mean, even if it was a workshop for two hours, yeah. that is um, important and inshallah we can do more and more, inshallah. Thank you, Dylan. Any other questions? It's a must, okay, no worries. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, as, a, as a professional uh, for art therapy, uh, here um, uh, more, yes, we have in UAE um, art therapy, but um, uh, abroad we have more uh, play therapy. What is your opinion about the difference between uh, these two, play therapy and art therapy, and which one you think, uh, I mean, not that because your art therapist, you say that, yeah, this one is better, but which one do you think uh, can help uh, better? I actually believe Thank both you. are um, very, very important. Uh, we have Dr. Saham Sayer, which is a Saudi play therapist in Bahrain. Uh, she has been working in Bahrain for about uh, actually nine years now since I started. She has started. I have clients that actually um, come to art therapy and play therapy. Play therapy is very, very useful for children that actually are not really into art and they would like to play. Um, so that, that aspect in it as well is as important as any other treatment. What's important is where does the client fit in? If the child is comfortable, that is the most important thing. Without comfort, nothing can be achieved. Thank you.
Hello, thank you very much for your interventions. Um, my name is Dina Asaf. I'm the head of the United Nations here, so it's very good to hear you included in the program today. So I want to thank you for your work. I thought it would be interesting for the audience to learn more about people who would like to learn more or to be educated in this work. Uh, how can they do that? Are there opportunities here in the UAE? And additionally, just as a side question, because you have art as therapy and art as psychotherapy, since we're all adults here, maybe as an ending to this, how people can use art as therapy for stress management or self-expression and so on. Thank you. Well, actually, Sarah has, um, will start a foundation course that's um, oh, within the, the British, British Art British Therapy yeah. Association. Um, so as I mentioned before, it's a Western-born profession, art psychotherapy. Um, there is no training course, a master degree program, because that is what was, is required as a minimum um, in, in the Middle East. Um, now, we have um, uh, developed with the British Art Therapy Association a foundation course. So anyone who's interested, um, it helps to develop um, skill sets in using and integrating art sensitively within their own professional framework, or it could help them um, as a stepping stone into going into a master degree program um, and taking on art psychotherapy further if they um, so wish to. But uh, oh, hopefully in the future, we do hope that there will be more opportunities for training. Um, and uh, yeah, Dalal is doing some uh, training also in Bahrain as well. Um, so we try <laughs> in to encourage. We do hope that there will be uh, more people that would be inspired or may see this as a as a as a pro profession that they would be then um, able to go and study and, and kind of come back to the region because we need that and we need uh, Arab speaking art therapists also. Uh, obviously, Dalal is a rarity, <laughs> but um, we need that. I think uh, within. Our community, so um, we also, sorry, yeah, also might I add about the training? Um, I have created a few short courses in UCL Qatar, which um, which was which actually went on for uh, two to three years, and it was still for people working with special needs, autism, and children with uh, verbal and nonverbal um, uh, children, just to see, just to like literally, it's not an won't qualify them to be art therapists, obviously, because you need to go throughout the, to the training as a master's degree. But um, within that, you can actually know certain tools, as you said, with the art as therapy for these people working with these children. Also in Bahrain, I am also uh, working with the Ministry of um, Education and the Ministry of Health, where the, there's uh, teachers and caregivers that are doing tremendous jobs, which um, I give, I'm very honored to give um, certain workshops into how to use certain techniques with the children to actually for cognitive development, um, psychological development, and so forth. As for the question about artist therapy, as all of us as individuals, mm -hmm. I think that is very important. I personally draw almost every day because I need to keep seeing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that is one. There is no, um, no end point to art. Get a sketchbook, paint, just scribble and do it. Thank you, Dylan. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Yes. I'm sorry, but I, I also would like to ask a dumb question, just like... <laughs> no dumb question. Uh, and do you have to be an artist to specialize in art psychotherapy or be... Uh, no. um, to, to train to be an art therapist or to um, receive art therapy? Oh, to train? No. So you can come from two sides. So you either come from um, an art background or you come from a psychology or within the allied health or social care sector uh, from a profession from, from there. So you can come from, from two sides. Yeah. One more question? Yes. Hi, um, I want to ask, uh, do you find that sometimes challenging with uh, cases uh, to diagnose them because they know that they are in a therapy, like they, they're not drawing the, the way that they usually draw? So how do you face these challenges? Um, actually, the diagnosis happens from a psychiatrist, and then they refer patients to us. 
if they feel there is no need for medication and their need for a psychological support. To answer your question, um, the because the ease of the art therapy, we give them, we give the client the absolute freedom to draw whatever darkness there is. There is a client that actually I uh, I would love to show his his artwork um, on uh, on there. He is a, a depressed uh, twenty year old who is um, who was studying and had to come back to stop his studying because he was uh, he had suicidal ideation. He used art as a means of um, one of the, the, the therapies that, um, that actually, he used like, he went into psychotherapy, art therapy and psychiatry. The art therapy to him, and he gave me a quote, and I think just to summarize that, he said that he never imagined that he would even know how to draw, and that art in some cases, or in some way, as he mentioned it, showed me stuff that I did not know about myself. He was completely enamored. He was in a very dark uh, position, and he said um, it was amazing that he actually changed his degree towards taking art because he just, uh, as he said, it was cathartic for him. Just to show you how can art can like actually be seen. This was in the beginning in initial sessions. Okay, so that's a second. You can see a bit more color in it. That's the process of when he started and then when he ended. And keep in mind, this is a four foot by three foot painting. And this boy has no, um, no background in art but that's why you don't need to have that background. I'm sorry. And that is the end. So you can see the incorporation of all the colors. Um, yeah. I think um, as someone engages in an art therapy process, it's typically on a, maybe on a weekly basis for one hour. And as the trust builds, the defenses kind of lessen, the trust is built, it surfaces to the forefront of the artwork. So we get to, to see really what is happening. And, and, and I think that's why we don't just see someone for one session and be like, oh yes, we know what's happening. We can see it in their artwork. That's not the, that's not the case. It's a process. Um, and then throughout that process, more and more can come up and then we deal with that together and we believe in co-creation. So we, we work on a plan together. What are the goals that we want to achieve? What are we seeing here? Beyond labels, beyond anything else. Um, and then we address that together. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, Dalal. Thank you, thank so, you so much thank you for, for coming. Us. Unfortunately, time is up. So, thank you so much for having us. Thank, thank you so you. much.